In our last video we looked at the Spectrum 128K that had been the victim of a bad recap. After fixing it up, it still wasn't happy. So we're going to build this to see if it helps. Hailing from Ben at Bite Delight in the Netherlands, this is the ZX Diagnostics Cart. And we're going to build it. Right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services, or browse a library of talented makers' designs, add them to your cart, and have them delivered directly to your door. The ZX Diagnostics cart has been through a few revisions, and this is the combined work of a lot of smart people. It comes with a really great manual. Auto-detecting your Spectrum model, it shows control signal, data line and power line status on its LEDs. The car also has the awesome ZX Spectrum Diagnostics ROM by Brendan Alford and Dylan Smith built in. So, in the box we have the build guide and manual. A sales flyer that's been designed in the style of an 80s magazine advertisement. Nice! And here comes the sexy bit. We have the cart PCB in stylish black. And helpfully, the tinier SMD components have been pre-installed. Great. Inside this bag is a collection of painstakingly labelled parts. Honestly, whoever put this together makes my OCD seem like some form of slovenly laziness. Great part handling, guys. The anti-static bag and foam houses the integrated circuits, sockets and importantly, a Spectrum Edge connector, with the location pin pre-installed. Finally, a 3D printed rubber foot as an alternative to the sticky rubber feet in the pack. This organisation and labelling job really is a work of evil genius. And I applaud that 100%. Let's have a look at the board that we're going to be working on. Apart from the pre-installed SMD components, we'll need to populate it with the components provided. All through hole. And it's a nice, well laid out design. So what tools will we need? A roll of solder and some way to keep the tip of your hot tool clean. I like wire wool on the end of mine. A soldering iron, preferably temperature controlled. A pair of flush side cutters. These are for clipping the legs or leads of the components after installation. and a couple of gummy bears to watch and judge your every move. Great. I've fallen out of love with this PCB holder of late. It seems to have developed a bit of a wobble. So apologies for any wobbly bits in this video. Sorry. Bite Delight have produced this detailed build order, so we're going to follow it. Diodes, resistors and IC sockets first. There's just one diode in this bag. The bag, label and effort far outweigh the value of the component. Deep kudos. Generally speaking, diodes act as a valve for current, allowing electrons to flow one way but not the other. Because of this, it's important to observe their polarity as marked by this stripe. The stripe marks the negative side of the diode, and that's called the cathode. A 
Although I said diodes can be thought of a one-way valve for current, there are some diodes that allow current to flow backwards if the reverse voltage is high enough, a bit like rolling back up a hill. This part is a Zener diode and has that feature. When the breakdown voltage is reached in the other direction, the electrons can flow backwards. These leads are a bit long, so I'll just tidy them up. Well, that's the diode done, so let's move on. The Gummy Crew have picked out the first bag of resistors for me. They're 330 ohms, and all the board locations are written on the bag, which is incredibly helpful. Resistors don't have polarity like a diode, so you can install them any way around, but I like to match their directions. The first 330 ohm resistor goes here, and then there's a row here. And a final 330 ohm here. Don't worry, I won't be showing you every single component being installed, but I will show at least one of every type and explain things to look out for along the way. There are a couple of gotchas if this is the first time you're ever building a kit. When soldering, don't forget to heat the lead and the pad at the same time. This kit should be a pretty simple build even for a beginner. That's our first resistor installed, so I'm going to go ahead and do the others. I'll use some speeding up techniques so I don't waste your valuable time. Please excuse my hands in the way and any dodgy soldering. When I film I have to work from way back behind the camera, so sometimes I can't even see what I'm doing. Ok, so these are in and they're all ready to solder. I've bent the legs in a bit of a mess here, but it's just to stop the resistors falling out of the board. To be honest, I could have been a bit tidier, but I'm excited to get it running. Again, when I'm filming from behind the camera, sometimes I have to clip the leads a bit long, then come back and retrim them. You can do this in one go though. I won't bore you with me retrimming my parts. I think they look okay, so it's time to move on. One kilo ohm resistors next. But if I film every resistor, you'll just go and watch people doing the splits on TikTok, won't you? So I think we can mostly gloss over the rest of the resistor installation, but I will show you a technique. This is a heat resistant tape. It's called polyamide or brand name Captain. Instead of bending the legs of these resistors, I can just solder them in straight. It's actually much easier this way. Please excuse the blobby long range soldering. Genuine capped on tape can be really expensive, but I've found the unbranded stuff to be generally okay. Don't try sellotape though, and don't ask me how I know. There, nice and easy. Right, we've done the diode, all the resistors, now onto the sockets. Stop laying about and do some work. We'll just put the edge connector aside for the moment. These are called dip or occasionally dill sockets and the number of pins is written on them if you squint. You'll notice that they have a notch marking on one end and this needs to be matched up with the notch printed on the board. To stop the socket falling out of the board while soldering, you can use Kapton tape, or simply bend over the four corner pins of the socket like I'm doing here. I like to hold the socket flush to the board underneath and solder two opposite corner pins to keep the socket in place. Whatever you do, don't hold the pin that you're soldering though, otherwise you're going to go ow pretty quickly. There, nice and solid. Let's speed through the other pins, 
I know I'm competing with Facebook doom scrolling and videos of kittens or something. One socket solidly installed. Now let's do the rest. We interrupt this broadcast to say that Mark has soldered the wrong hole. Whoopsie! Suction makes it better though. Ah. <clears throat> Moving swiftly on, we get the rest of the socket soldered in as fast as we possibly can. Super speedy. Okay, some of the solder joints are a bit blobby, but I was rushing and I will reflow them a bit later. But the IC sockets are now installed. And with that done, it's time to move on to the LEDs. These red LEDs are for showing activity on the data lines. They're going to be installed here. Like other diodes that we've mentioned, LEDs have a polarity with the longer leg being the positive anode and the shorter leg being the negative cathode. You can also tell the negative cathode with this flat portion on the LED's plastic package. The build instructions say that the ground leg needs to be up, but you should also note the square solder pads here. Square solder pads often indicate the negative, ground or common connections on a PCB. I'm bending the leads again because I'll be using a finger to hold the LED flush to the board while soldering. By bending the leads, it helps to hold the inverted components in place. Then I hold the LED flush to the board as I said, and I pull the lead straighter. Then I sold them into place. And yes, you could use Capton for this, but I'm trying to show different techniques. I'm trying to move away from using Bluetack because I've run out of foreign language variants of Smurf Poo. With the light emitting diode soldered, we clip their excess leads. More LEDs, but this time blue for the control line indicators. The instructions say ground up for these as well, so I won't waste your time. And here they are, all nicely installed like their red friends. The green LEDs show the presence of different voltages on your Spectrum's board. And there's a potential gotcha here, because they're not all orientated the same way around. That is shown in the instructions, but you could miss it, like you missed me installing these green LEDs. With all our LEDs installed, it's time to move on to the capacitors. These are 100 nanofarad or 0.1 microfarad ceramic parts. Like the earlier resistors, these are non-polar, but it's nice to line up the coding on the case if you possibly can. I'm simply spreading the legs on these to sort them out as quickly as possible. And then I'm soldering them in in the usual fashion, heating the pad and the leg at the same time, then feeding the solder. Finally, clipping the leads. With that example done, let's go ahead and install the rest of the 100 nanofarad capacitors. These are really easy to do, so it's a quick process. That's all the capacitors installed, so now let's move on to the next thing, a BC548B transistor. Beautifully bagged and labelled. 
Transistors are usually given a Q designation on PCBs, and this part is no different, being given the designation of Q6. Note the rounded back and the flat front of the transistor. This is important. A transistor has a collector pin, a base pin and an emitter pin. The silkscreen printing on the PCB shows us the right way to put the component into place. For speed, I'll just hold this transistor in place and quickly solder the leads. Nice and quick. Although more haste and less speed would have been better because I've caused a problem here. My impatience has caused the solder between these leads to bridge and no amount of reflowing seems to clear it. Bottom. Eventually I managed to break the surface tension of the melted solder by pushing the tip of the hot iron between its legs. But it made a mess. Let us never speak of this again. Please. Thanks. But I did take this opportunity to put the PCB back into the holder the other way around. Because it's time to install the pin jumpers and headers. Header pins are usually supplied in a strip, and this kit is no exception. We simply need to cut the header pins to size. Let's install the ROM OE jumper first. It needs two pins, so we'll cut two from the strip. The shorter part goes into the board. If you try to hold these pins in place while soldering, you'd burn your digits. So we'll use another piece of polyamide tape. And one satisfying peel later, we have our jumper pins installed. And also our jumper cap. Jumpers one and two are three pin strips, so let's get those installed next. Again, I use a strip of captain tape to hold the pins in place whilst I solder. Nice and easy. Polyamide tape is really heat resistant. Let's pop the jumper caps on the pins for safekeeping, then we can move on to the switches. The first switch is here and it's for changing the red LEDs from activity indicators to diagnostic mode. There's the optional rubber feet, and our three switches. And this is where I ran into my first and only minor problem with the kit. The switch is a smaller pin pitch than the PCB holes, so I had to splay the outer legs slightly to get it to fit into the PCB. Once it was soldered in and the leads were clipped, there was no problem though. The switch seems solid and worked fine. Now on to the two tactile switches. The nice thing about this type of switch is not only are they impossible to install incorrectly due to being slightly rectangular, but they also grip the PCB and don't slip out whilst you're soldering. Click, click.
These switches could get quite a bit of physical stress, so I'm giving them a good amount of solder to reinforce the electrical connections. And now the part that a lot of people dread, soldering that edge connector. Take note that there's a key in the connector that needs to be matched to the solder pads on the board. But here's the hard bit, the leads are nowhere near the solder pads. Using a flat hard surface we need to bend the pins at an angle so that they nearly touch. It doesn't need to be perfect, just close enough to solder. Even when close enough the connector flops about, so I pull out our old friend the captain tape. Using the tape under tension it lets me hold the connector braced squarely against the edge of the PCB. There's actually a ridge on the inside of the edge connector that fits really nicely. Doing it this way is actually ideal. Our edge connector is held perfectly in position. With our pins bent and the edge connector taped into place, we solder the two end pins on each side of the connector. This will hold it in place. We're using large fillets of solder to add to the physical strength of the edge connector. With the four end pins holding the connector in place, we can remove the tape and get on with soldering the rest of the pins. Don't worry too much if the pin isn't directly touching the pad, we'll use enough solder on these large pads to connect it firmly. And now we do the other side. And that's all the soldering done, it's just the chips now. But first I have to suffer Terry and Dave's disapproving glare. They really don't like a mess. They think the workspace is a disgrace and say I need to clean up before installing those ICs. Well, I happen to agree. The workspace is clean now so let's install those chips. I'm looking forward to this. The instructions list the chip locations and types. Let's start with the U1. The 74LS138 is a demultiplexer chip, so it's probably used for decoding the memory operations. I push one side in, and then the other. Of course, making sure we match up with the all important notch. Turning the board around to visually check that all our legs are in the proper holes, I declare that this is a properly installed IC. Time to install the 74LS32. This is a quad dual input OR gate and its function is a support role to the circuit decoding the Spectrum's internal workings. Well, that's my guess anyway. I didn't actually design this board. A look from the side is a good visual check on the installation of the chips. They look okay. The IC at U3 is a big one, and I have to say that the pre-bending of the pins make this a joy to install. This is a chip containing the programming and is pre-flashed. Handy. The 512 kilobyte flash RAM is the brains of the cart and contains all the diagnostic software already. Lastly, we have three 74LS273 ICs to install. These are a kind of a delay chip. They see an electrical change and hold that info until the next change starts to happen. This is likely how the LEDs stay solid for us and we can see activity instead of them blinking almost imperceptibly. Smart stuff. So, the cart is built. It looks so analog and gloriously sci-fi.
I'm almost afraid to try it. This jumper needs to stay on unless you're using a Brazilian clone like a TK90X or TK95. J1 is for boot selection of the cart's flash ROM or the Spectrum's own ROM. And Jumper 2 can set the cart to ignore a weak or missing M1 line on the Z80, which could interfere with some of the tests. It's quite a common issue on Spectrums. First we need to test the cart, so here's my own working toast rack. As usual I'll be using one of Ian Priddy's awesome Retro Computer Shack cables. And a 9 volt, 2 amp, centre negative power supply to test that the Spectrum's working. And I hope it is. And as expected it is. Now we can test our new cart. Before we plug anything in, we must remove the power. The cart plugs into the slot in the rear. Let's just remove this again for a second. Paying attention to the key and notch on the connector, we just need to push our unit in firmly, as far as it will go. I've cleaned my slot already, but always check your own slot for grunge. And we forgot something. The feet. Let's use this rubbery new version that just clips around the PCB. That works really nicely. OK, let's test. And it looks and feels glorious as the Spectrum boots into the ZX Diagnostics ROM that was pre-programmed into the flash of our newly built cart. I'd call this build a success. The LEDs are nice and bright, even against the lights that I use for filming here. The LEDs are easy to see on this healthy spectrum, and I think it's thanks to those 74LS273s. Well, I reckon it is. So now we know that the cart works, but what will it show on the broken spectrum? Let's whip out the power and set it up. One to eight K of raw power, man. I still play sixteen K jetpack. What a time to be alive! We need to clean the edge connector on this. It's old, and it survived my house fire. Using an abrasive fiberglass pencil works best, I find. We need to do both sides of the board. This isn't a cosmetic clean. You can use metal polish for that, but this will really help the cart to work. A dirty edge connector will be a non-starter. Just look at the filth. Just look at it. Filthy. We'll just use the mainboard for testing. I think the keyboard membrane on this machine is shot anyway, and the missing keyboard isn't important for this test, but um, connecting the power regulator is, and I nearly missed that. First we'll remind ourselves of the issue from the last video by powering up without the cart installed. So. First power gives us this screen with horizontal black and white bars and a black border. The reset switch does nothing. Cycling the power gives us the same black and white bars, but this time with a blue border. And this result is then consistent through further power cycles. I don't know, it doesn't feel like a RAM issue, but almost like a Z80 or ROM timing issue. OK, power out and cart in. This is going to be interesting. 
powering on, the NMIM reset signals light fractionally before they're joined by static M1, ROMCS, IORQ, write and reset signals. So let's press reset on the card. The Spectrum magically boots the diagnostic ROM from the card's internal flash, with those stuck control signals springing into life. I've sped this up a little bit, but the Spectrum then goes on to pass all the diagnostic tests. Incredibly interesting. After the diagnostic tests complete, the computer pages in the internal Spectrum ROM with no problems. So what do we think? I'd like to get your ideas before we make part three. Big thanks to Bike Delight for putting together this fun and useful kit. You can also buy it pre-built. And as usual, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Big thanks to Steve Smith, Ben Versteeg, Dylan Smith, Brendan Alford, Simon Brattle, Graham Mason, Victor Truco, and Russ Pittman. And it goes without saying a massive thanks to my amazing Patreon supporters, without whom I couldn't make these videos. In return, my Patreon supporters get ad-free early access to all my videos, plus exclusive videos from behind the scenes that don't go anywhere else. If you'd like to join my Patreon, come to patreon.com forward slash markfixesstuff. It'd be lovely to see you there. You'd also get on the screen like this. Just think how jealous your friends will be. Right, well, on to the next video. And whilst you're waiting for that, why didn't you go and watch one of these videos? I'll be really grateful. Thank you.